following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Yo, Philly. How you doing? Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. I'm Bill Cachetis, your host on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. Dirty baseballs have been part of the national pastime ever since the game was born. In the 19th century, teams used baseball uh, baseballs for as long as possible, regardless of how scuffed or damaged they were. Sometimes just one ball was used for an entire game. As a result, pitchers had a distinct advantage over the hitters. They could nick and scuff the ball, making it more difficult for the hitter to see the leather sphere, let alone hit it. Not only did doctoring the ball make its movement unpredictable, but also dangerous. On August 16, 1920, for example, Carl Mays, a pitcher for the New York Giants, threw a spitball to Ray Chapman, the shortstop for the Cleveland Indians. The ball was thrown so hard, so fast, and so unpredictably that Chapman could not get out of the way. It struck him in the temple and killed him. Two things happened as a result of that pitch. First, the spitball was outlawed, and second, umpires began to replace damaged balls during games with new baseballs. Now, a new problem emerged. Since the leather on the new baseball was smooth, glossy, and slick, pitchers complained they could not get a good grip on the ball, thus the hitter had an advantage. Hitters, on the other hand, complained that the bright white cover reflected light, making it difficult for them to see the ball, thus the pitchers had the advantage. Tired of listening to the constant complaints, umpires tried to create a competitive balance by rubbing the new baseballs with shoe polish, tobacco juice, and the dirt beneath their feet before putting it into play. While these substances did indeed dull the baseball's leather surface, they also damaged the baseballs in the process. New complaints arose now about the dangers of a dirty, scuffed baseball that were not only, was not only difficult for the batter to see, but also dangerous. All the bickering continued until the late 1930s when Lena Blackburn, a third base coach for the old Philadelphia Athletics, found the solution to the problem. Blackburn began mixing various batches of mud from his favorite fishing hole in southern New Jersey near the Delaware River and water to create a substance that would dull the surface of glossy new baseballs, making them easier to grip for pitchers. Blackburn's eventual concoction, a rubbing mud that was very fine, like a thick chocolate pudding, did not wreck the balls either. Shortly after Major League Baseball introduced Rule 301C, which states that all baseballs shall be properly rubbed so that the gloss is removed, and the entire American League began using Lena Blackburn's rubbing mud on their newly minted baseballs. By the 1950s, Blackburn's rubbing mud was being applied to six dozen or more baseballs by the umpires or the clubhouse attendants of every Major League team, and a decade later, some minor league and college teams had also adopted the practice. Jim Bentliff, president of the Lena Blackburn Baseball Rubbing Mud Company in Margate City, New Jersey, is our guest on this podcast. He will give us the inside story to Blackburn's baseball career, how we came to discover the rubbing mud, and how we created a monopoly selling it to Major League Baseball. Welcome to the podcast, Jim. Hey, Bill. How you doing? Great. Uh, listen, let's begin with Russell Aubrey Lena Blackburn. Who exactly was this man? Well, uh, Lena Blackburn was a, um, a he was a uh, professional baseball player in the early 1900s. Um, he played for the Chicago White Sox in uh, 19. 19- 12, 13, um, and uh, that's where he started. How talented a player was he? He was an infielder, right? He was, yeah, he was He was an infielder. Um, he was, um, he was pretty talented. He, he played, a, played a good infield. Um, he couldn't hit, from what I, I was told, he couldn't really hit real well but he was uh he was a talented infielder and uh he knew the game real well Mm -hmm. at least long enough to stick around in it as a player for eight eight years 
Uh, now, I guess one of his last positions as a coach um, was with Connie Mack, the, the legendary manager of the old Philadelphia A's. Uh, Mack hired him as a third base coach in 1933. Uh, what, what was his relationship like with Connie Mack? Do you know? Uh, not firsthand. Um, I, I do know they were very good friends. Um, they, uh, they spent uh, a lot of time together and, um, you know, they, they had mutual respect between the two of them. They were, um, they were good friends. Mm -hmm. Did he befriend any of the other players, especially future Hall of Famers like Mickey Cochran, Lefty Grove, or Jimmy Fox? Uh, he came to know um, he came to know a whole lot of a whole lot of uh, big players. I know in his his early years in the white with the White Sox, he was he was close with uh, Ty Cobb and uh, Eddie Collins. Um, I do have pictures of him with with Connie Mack, like at his birthday party and and in dugouts and in Boston and stuff. Um, he was he he was around the league for a long time. He was still involved with baseball probably into the fifties. Uh, he was a scout. After after he got done um, with Connie Mack, he he kind of shifted over to the National League, and um, you know he he did some scouting for the Phillies, and uh, you know he he made his he made his way around baseball. He was around for a long time. Now, how exactly did the rubbing mud venture start? Uh, I mean, we know that the umpires were listening to all these complaints from the hitters, saying the pitchers had an advantage, from the pitchers saying the hitters had an advantage. Um, right. How did how, how did this how did this idea of the rubbing mud uh, come up with Blackburn? Well. Um... As you mentioned, the, the Chapman incident uh, forced them to, to do something about the baseball itself. Um, and I don't have any any um, hard evidence, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that Lena started experimenting with ways um, to degloss the ball probably shortly after that incident. Uh, it wasn't wasn't until the mid thirties or, or nineteen thirty eight ish that um he came up with the mud, but I think he spent a lot of time experimenting with different ways to uh take the gloss off. Yeah, he, he might not have intended it, but Lena Blackburn turned out to be an entrepreneur. Um he started the rubbing mud company did he ever enter a legal agreement with Major League Baseball as the exclusive provider of the product, though? There has never been anything more than a handshake and a verbal agreement that that uh, we would provide the mud. Wow, and that still continues today. Continues today. We we have no. There's no written contract. Um, and basically, a lot of that is the fact that we we have the only mud that does what it does the way it does it. Um, you know, they've, they've tried other things, as you mentioned. They've tried all kinds of things. Uh, this is the thing that works. Um, you know, and, and back when it first started, uh, the American leagues were, were the only ones using it. And even then... I don't know that all the American League teams used it. I know um, Lena would get telegrams saying we need some of your magic mud, um, but it wasn't. Uh, I, I don't have any kind of record of him shipping mud to everybody, but I know um, that he only dealt with the mate at the uh, American League for a long time. Mm -hmm. Now, now, that rubbing mud has been described as very fine, like a thick chocolate pudding. And my guess is so the leather will absorb that and and the discoloration will become part of that leather itself. It just won't 
rub off. Um, so, so that's the uniqueness uh, of the rubbing mud. But is, is that uniqueness due really to the soil itself along the New Jersey side of the Delaware River where he started harvesting it? Or, or is that from the specific harvesting process that Blackburn invented? Um, it's it's uh, probably a little of both, but it, it's mostly the geology, um, the ge geology and the geography of, of where the mud is um, located, mm -hmm. and and what they the way they use it, they use it very very thin, a very very um, tiny bit. They they put it in their uh, they put it in their palm and they'll water it down even from there. Um, and it's it's the uh, you know the the minerals in the mud itself create an uh, an abrasive quality that takes the sheen the the glossy coating off without damaging the leather of the ball at all. Mm -hmm. Now and it, it's pretty unique. It's pretty unique to where we get it. It's, it's, um, you know, that's that's why we're the only ones that that have it. Can can you share that harvest? I mean, I understand you can't share the secret location, but can you share the details about the specific harvesting process um, that he used? And I guess you still continue to use the harvest that mud. Yeah, I can do that. Um, the the only change in the way it's in, in the harvesting is the amount that I harvest. Mm -hmm. um, when when Lena started the company and even in, into the up until 1965, um, it was it was just um, harvested into a, a copper well a copper kettle or a metal kettle mm -hmm. like that you would put on a stove or over a campfire. Um, and that, you know, my, my grandfather, in fact, the first time I went out to harvest mud was with my grandfather and we took a metal, probably a five gallon kettle and filled it up with mud and, and brought it back to the house. Uh, now I get, uh, 35 gallon trash can, um, and I fill probably six of them mm. for for the year or for mm. well for the baseball season but we you know we've we've uh expanded um the nfl a lot of the nfl teams use it now on the football so no kidding well no. i'm sure it isn't for discoloration purposes there the pig skin is brown so is it's, it for it's grip for the, it's for the grip yeah it's uh and it, it's been in at least the last five Super Bowls, I know at least one, if not both of the teams, used it in the Super Bowl. So well, apparently, know, Brady wasn't using Super enough Bowl of it. Uh, Brady wasn't using enough of it a couple of Super Bowls uh, again because there wouldn't have been a Deflate Gate if <laughs> <laughs> if not. Um, for listeners, um, Lena Blackburn died in February of 1968, and since he had no children um, in his will, he left the business to a childhood friend, John Hawes, who had helped him harvest the mud. Hawes' son-in-law was Burns Bentliff, who was your father, right, Jim? Correct. Or your grandfather? Correct. No, your Burns was my father. Yes. Oh, your father. Okay. So this became a family business. How, how exactly did you become involved in it? Okay, well, John Haas got the, got the business from Lena. Excuse me. And uh, John had, had one child who was my mother. Mm -hmm. So when, when John took the mud over in 1965, um, my mother and father took it because my, my grandfather was as old as Lena, so he really couldn't do it himself. Um, so he, he gave it to my mother and father, who um, 
1969, we, we named it Lena Blackburn Rubbing Mud, the year it was put in the Hall of Fame. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure how I got it, how I ended up, because I come from a, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of nine kids. Um, but my, my mother, when I was probably 12 years old, I think I remember my mother saying to me, someday you're going to take over the mud. Now, how she chose me, I have no idea, but that's how it happened. She said, someday you're going to take it over. Um, and that's, that's how I came to, to be the president of a mud company. <laughs> Um, again, I, I realize that you, you can't share the secret location of, of the mud hole or the harvesting process, but I'm, I'm struck by the fact that many people have tried to find out where this thing, you know, where the site is. In, in fact, you told CNN reporter Thomas Andrus in the, in the 2009 interview that, quote, if anybody happens to catch me in the act of harvesting mud, I come up with a story to give them a reason I'm putting mud in a bucket. I've told people I use it in my garden. I use it for my rose bushes. I use it for bee stings and poison ivy and any kind of story. Uh, okay, but um, uh, has, has, has that covered you? Have you still remained to keep this uh, secret? Because I'm sure... You know, there have been times where people wanted to get a cut of this this deal, you know, with Major League yeah. Baseball. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, it's it's still the same the same thing. I, I give a story. Um, I you know I worry more about the um, the location getting out. I worry more about um, the area being. Uh, damaged than right. I am, than I worry about the mud because I know Major League Baseball knows where the where to buy the mud. They know where they get it from. Anybody who who follows Major League Baseball knows that there's one source. Um, you know, I'm the prime source. Um, I worry more about the area getting getting damaged from being you know being overrun by by curious people. You know mm -hmm. that that. That scares me more than anything. Have but you those ever had stories any, I still use? Yeah. Ha, have you ever had any complaints from Major League Baseball uh, about the mud? Um. No, not not as a no, not as a, uh, a full shipment. I've had comp I've had a team maybe once. Mm, once or twice, I've had I've gotten a call from a team saying that the mud wasn't um, wasn't right, um, or the mud was uh, what, the mud was there was something wrong with the mud, and and usually I find out that uh, somebody got to the mud before the people who who are test with using it mm -hmm. and either diluted it or, or took it, you know, stole. I, I mean, I've had mud delivered and, and stolen from the, the stadium by, you know, somebody who just wanted to have the mud. So, mm -hmm. um, we, I mean, the worst I've ever heard is, is um, you know, a container had a little more sand in it than they like. Um, sometimes that could happen. But that's it's very rare that, that anything any anything like that comes up. Have you ever had any requests, particularly unusual requests, from any of the major league clubs? No, <laughs> no, I'm surprised that, that I don't get any. I mean, they all say send me the best luck you got, but right. uh, no, nobody's nobody's had any any un, unusual requests. In, in, in that uh, 2009 interview with CNN, uh, you also said that back at that time, 2009, the company only earned about $20,000 a year and that you were working full-time as a printing press operator. 
Um, how's the company, company performing these days? About the same? Well, we picked up a little bit of business, but, you know, mostly because of the NFL, that's, that's pretty much the additional business. We're, um, we're, not, we're not getting rich on it, I'll tell you that. Right. I'm not getting really drawn it. Now uh, I am I am retired now, but um you know, I, I have my retirement income. Mm-hmm. The the so mud income hasn't changed much. You're you're doing this basically for the legacy and for the you know, the enjoyment of it, is is that correct? Yes. Yeah, it's it's always been um for the love of the game more than anything. Now, I understand that Rawlings has kind of issued a challenge. The, the Rawlings is a sporting goods company that makes all the hand-stitched baseballs that are used in, in Major League Baseball. I understand that they've been working on a new ball that is supposedly easier to grip and does not require rubbing with mud. Uh, and they've been working on this for a couple of years now, uh, but they still haven't perfected it. If that experimental ball is successful, will your company continue to produce the rub, rubbing mud, if for nothing else, for the National Football League? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's our our intention is to keep supply and keep you know keep the mud going. Um, you know, we have like like I said, the the NFL uses it. Um, I have collectors that call me and want want mud I have <coughs> excuse me I have um, you know grandparents and parents that want it I have little league teams that want it I have high schools and colleges that still want it um, you know this this new leather that that Rawlings has been experimenting with I've talked to a few uh, few of the minor league pitchers who've used it and they're not they're not real impressed with the new covers mm-hmm. um so you know, I don't see anything changing in the near future. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it does, though, there's there's still a market out there for the, you know, this is part of the history of the game, so That's there'll right. be a market for it. Yeah, I I, you know? I would believe that simply not the discoloration as much as just the uh, um, the grip. I mean, pitchers, the game of pitching is is so dependent on grips and feel of the ball. Uh, yeah. And I don't think Rawlings could invent a baseball that would satisfy every single pitcher. I mean, if you go back and look at the history of the game, uh, all different types of substances were used to create the, the yeah. type of, of uh, grip that a pitcher wants. And that's a very individual thing. So yeah. uh, yes. it would seem to me that you know that uh, you got a good future, and it's one of the the quainter traditions in the game. Uh, Lena Blackburn yeah. rubbing mud. Um, so Jim, well, I, if, I was uh, I was a I was a little nervous about the the, the new leather the new cover uh, when I first heard about it. Mm-hmm. My my son was going crazy. He thought that was the end of the world. But the, you know, the more I researched it, the more more I realize that um, we're we're a part of the game that it's really not going to be something they just push aside because there's a new leather. Um, and you know, and hearing from people who've used the other color, um, I'm I'm not real worried. Mm-hmm. Now, if listeners or anybody wanted to. Uh, contact you to make a purchase of the mud for collect, uh, collectible reasons or, you know, to use it uh, for a high school team, how would they get in touch with you? Uh, you have a website, uh, you know, what's your web address? Do you have a phone number that you would uh, be comfortable sharing? Uh, I, I prefer going through the web. Okay. And it's uh, www.baseballrubbingmud.com. Dot com, all one word. Baseball rubbing mud. Dot com. Great, Jim. Thanks for being with us, and, and good luck with the rubbing mud business and in the the upcoming season. I think it's a, a, a wonderful 
tradition, uh, you know, in a game that's rapidly changing. Uh, right. so, so thanks for being with us. Thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for thinking of me. And uh, and it does work for bee stings. It and does. Poison ivy. Yes, it All does. All right. <laughs> All right. Just so you know. Okay. All right. And thank you, Phil. Thank you, Philly fans, for tuning in. See you next week for another podcast of Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. This is Bill Cachetis rounding third and heading home on the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. The proceeding was a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Thank you for listening.